Um, ladies, so what are some of the settings that you find yourself code switching in? And if you can maybe share some examples of what that might mean for you. Um, I think for me, like I said before, I've kind of like found communities where I don't have to necessarily code switch like within my PWI, but I think I mostly find myself code switching like when I'm in like the classroom, obviously, because I can't like use like, the same like slang that like she said in the video, like that she uses with her friends. Um, and I think that just kind of means just like changing my tone and changing like my vocabulary to kind of just like fit the setting. Um, so I think it's mostly just in the classroom. So like when I'm outside of the classroom, I think outside the classroom that I, classroom, I can be more myself, I guess, with my friends because, um, they're like, they kind of understand the thing that I'm using. So. Yeah, for me, um, so professional settings. So if I'm doing anything sort of like a competition, if I have to do a speak, uh, if I have to speak at a, sp a specific event um, and similar to Uche, even if I have to speak uh, during an important class discussion, I will often code switch and um, I will not use the slang terms I usually use. I will not have the same tone. Um, those are the two big ways that I code switch. Um, I often find that I code switch a lot in more professional settings, um, like for example, like something that's really relevant now, college interviews. Um, I often find that um, sub unconsciously I'm sort of trying to enunciate my words or use um, words that are like seemed as, uh, or use words that are seen uh, as just more like intellectual, if you will. And so when I'm in those in these more formal settings, I find that I'm more code switching, whether it be in an interview or if I'm um, meeting with a teacher or anything like that. Um, but like Uche said, for example, I have found solace in these smaller communities um, where I'm with students who look like me, who have the same values as me, who are from the same background as me, where I don't need to code switch. And it's sort of a breath of fresh air. Thank you for that. Marlon, I don't know if you have any contributions to this. Yeah. Um, in fact, I, I wanted to be very, I wanted to actually be very, cause I have a little bit of a different view. Um, code switching actually is a survival tactic is a survival skill. It should never be looked at as anything negative. All right. And I think that it's important to understand. And why is, why do I say that? Because I would imagine that this kind of code switching happens when you're in your parents, if you're around your parents as well. So I don't expect you to be using the same language and same um, attitude that you would have if you're going to be um, with your parents. I also wouldn't expect you to dress or act the same way if you're with a romantic interest, right? So different situations do require us to adapt. But what I think is the, um, I think, um, you know, is the issue in this case is that, um, is the, what, you know, goes back to racial construct. What do we, how do we see, you know, what meanings do we attach to these different racial things that we are seeing, you know, and that, you know, and, and that why, that means that when we code switch, we do, we do, we feel like we're trying to fit into something or we're trying to, you know, because basically the, the racial construct that we're operating in says that basically white is better white is more is is fantastic white gets you jobs white does that that's the co that so when we are um i'll maybe i can take 10 more seconds if you don't mind <laughs> when um um that's what we call teacher's license teacher's license you guys should understand that so um you know so when we have this situation where we have to code switch our code switching sometimes is out of survival if i'm in jamaica i have to talk like i'm a jamaican maybe that will save my life right maybe it's a bad one right but the bottom line is that if i lived there for long enough and i started using some of the lexicon that 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 exists in that area and code switch when i'm with Jam when i'm with my jamaican friends it will show familiarity co um community building it would show that it would show them oh this person knows our culture and then allow them to 
um, 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 you know, communicate. So anyway, I'm done. Enough. I've, I've taken back my teacher's license. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marlon. Thank you, Marlon. So uh, as we go to the next slide on affinity groups, I wanted to um, kind of go back to one of the comments that uh, we have here um, from my friend Toy. She's saying that at HBCUs, you're taught to be your brother and sister's keeper. She only learned racism, capitalism, and ar archaic patriarchal I ideologies from my PWI. Um, so as we kind of reflect on that topic, um, with, the t with the idea or the topic on affinity groups, another friend of mine, she and I were discussing this recently, and um, we were saying how being amongst your people, I personally consider that to be an act of resistance and self-preservation. Like, like as we were talking about earlier, being intentional about formulating these spaces where you're comfortable and being yourself and you can kind of share in some of these experiences without trying to feel like you're trying to make up for who you are not. Um, so with that, let's talk about affinity groups and why they are necessary. So Marlon, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so ladies, go ahead. Yeah, um, I can do this. Um, for PWIs, just as an overview, affinity groups are spaces for POC and other marginalized groups to come together and discuss their shared experiences that occur due to their uh, individual identities. And so on the screen here, we have pictures from our affinity groups at our respective schools. And so basically to have a little overview of what we do in our affinity groups as a head i personally try to focus on joy creating experiences where all peers throughout the entire upper school can come together and just be themselves their unapologetic black selves um their funny selves whatever that means to them in this space so we do have a good mixture of talking about prevalent issues in our community but we do also uh, set a set a a part time for students to just bond with one another and just be with each other in that space because we don't often have it. Yeah, um, I go to the same school as Miracle and like we're part of the same affinity group, um, obviously because we're black students. And I think like she said, it's just kind of a space where we can just feel comfortable around one another and kind of just relate to like our own experiences. And I think when we're talking about like these like deeper um, issues, we're able to just kind of like delve deeper because we're able to empathize with each other and we're able to like understand like the emotions that we're feeling. So like, there isn't like this awkward tension where it's like oh like like this happened, but like we I can't understand what like I can't understand what you're feeling because like I'm like not black, I'm like not part about I'm not a part of, of that that racial group. And so I think like these spaces are definitely very important to have and these PWIs to kind of just create this safe space for um, P POC and like other like minority groups. Yeah, so um, my experience is a bit different than Miracles and Uche's um, because my um, affinity group, our Black Student Union, um, wasn't founded until my junior year um, and I'm one of the co-leaders and my school was founded in 1866, so that's very telling. What? Yeah. <laughs> I think that there was an attempt in 1970 to form a Black Student Union, but it never truly developed. That was the end of the Civil War. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's definitely been long overdue, which I think is uh, another reason why it's definitely necessary. Mm -hmm. Because when I came to my school in the seventh grade, having a Black Student Union would have eased my transition so much just to have a physical space where I can be with people who share um, the same background as me and I don't have to explain myself to. And so I feel very blessed um, in my junior and now senior year to be one of uh, the leaders of the Black Student Union and provide that space for students um, when I didn't have that space. So it's sort of a full circle moment because I'm now able to provide that space that I didn't have. Um, this is just a presentation that me and some of the other um, Black Student Union leaders at my school gave um, two weeks ago um, for uh, our presentation on Black History Month. So throughout the month, um, this 
we've been covering different black artists and sort of celebrating their work and so this artist is simone lee and so we each um sort of had talking points and we presented some of her artwork and then in our library it was also displayed and what is i think the most significant part of this presentation is that it was in front of the entire school in the morning assembly that we gather at every morning so it was a crowd of 600 plus people and so in that sense we're sort of having a broader reach and in that sense um creating more of a culturally competent community with these um different presentations that we were um displaying other works of art and title this sculpture honors black femininity while also investigating historical and intersecting ideas of race beauty and the association of black women's bodies with work as you can see, the sculpture is cast in bronze and it is also modeled after a Zulu ceremonial stone. I like this piece because Simone uses forms from traditional African culture to honor and elevate the labor and strength of Black women. This piece reminds me a lot of the Black women in my life that mean a lot to me and also embody the aspects Simone represents in her work. Yeah, and then for the second video, so at Uche and I school, we had a Black History Month assembly last week, and we decided to center our assembly on Black joy. So again, kind of switching the narrative that is often fed to students. And so um, at the very end of our assembly, um, we decided to have a little dance performance, which is what you'll see. That was fun. <laughs> so let's answer this question. How can affinity groups create change? Um, I think I think affinity group I think it's just like becoming more involved in the community and like kind of like how we did with the, in Black History Month, like how we kind of had our own assemblies just like showcasing different aspects of like black culture, just kind of like um showing just like how diverse and like how like beautiful and like rich like like black culture is and like how like there's like a lot of variety within it like, it's not just being like being african-american or like being like caribbean or like nigerian um just like showing like that diverse, diverse culture is very important i think yeah i would definitely echo uche's points um i think for example like what we did for our black student union bringing the topics that we are talking about in um these smaller affinity groups to the larger community um and sharing these things are the ways in which that i think affinity groups can create broader change and um sort of induce progress yeah so uh on a small level affinity groups provide again a safe space for students to just be themselves for you know a, a manner of minutes which helps translate into classrooms you know gives them the confidence to participate and again be unapologetically who they are um, but also in terms of the people outside of those affinity groups uh, switching narratives is very important and i think affinity groups have the space to do that and then also um, with affinity groups you have the opportunity to fundraise on behalf of the club and really go out into these communities and create change where you really want it to happen and influence community members within your entire school to participate and educate themselves as well on these issues. I think we might have touched on this a little bit earlier, but are you, um, when it comes to affinity groups, are you all open? What, what is your opinion or 
how do you feel about people who are not part of that group um, joining just as either as an ally or just to kind of like learn more or just to, you know, whatever the case may be? How are you guys receptive to that or how do you kind of see that? Um, I think that affinity groups should definitely just be for POC and like the people within like those like racial groups, ethnic groups. And I think like if people want to, if people like outside of those groups, they want to learn more about like, the culture that think that they can like do that research on their own. And I think it's like not to like be like exclusive for anything. I think it's just that like, like everybody else at that school like, looks like you. So I feel like we need to create this space for people who don't see as much people who look like them to feel more comfortable and to feel more safe. So I feel like bringing in like people outside of that group can make people not as open to like share their experiences and like participate. I see Utre's point. Um, for sure, these affinity groups are sacred spaces for um, students of color. But at the same time, I think that it's important um, for like white people who truly want to learn to have the opportunity to learn. So I think, for example, if they sit in on a meeting um, that is agreed upon, obviously, by the entire affinity group that they can come to, First of all, um, if they just sit in on a meeting and, you know, not try to take up space and, you know, voice their opinions or thoughts or sort of talk over people, I think that it is completely valid, not a lot or um, on very on a very continuous occasion, but just every now and then for these um, people who truly want to be allies and and support to sort of have that space to learn without taking up space and uh, talking over these important um these important voices in these affinity groups um i think that there can be a healthy balance my point of view is pretty similar to tape's um i believe that similar to uche i think that overall uh, these spaces are safe spaces for a reason and it's because they are compact and they are small but i do think that there should be some sort of opportunities for uh, all affinity groups or all people within a school to come together and actually my school uh, does do that um, since COVID we haven't been able to have it but usually they have a night of discussion between all affinity groups and actually include other schools as well um, I think all of the burden should not be placed on students again so I'm not really sure about often letting these um non-POC into our spaces just because it's just another opportunity where we're put on the spotlight or we're being like watched and we have to you know fix what we say in order to come across the correct way or for um, our voices to be understood so I think there can be like a healthy balance um, but similar to what Tape said it should definitely be agreed upon um, and planned beforehand I don't think it should just be open right right uh, that's that's actually the question I have. I want to ask you guys, you know, because also you have to understand that um, I know people in my, I know students that I have that there's nothing you can tell them that is good in regards to white. They've been traumatized, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. We're not blaming anybody for, we don't know why or what series of events allow people to not there's nothing you can do they refuse they don't like white people right and you understand why right? i mean you know we're all dealing with it some people have stronger opinion than others right so my question is kind of like um but then again what top what top at, um this lane that top has created for diversity and promoting of inclusion because remember i am very big on the, you know the restorative tenants and that promotes inclusivity right because we want to make sure that even if we're having these affinity groups we also take in our role on how do we bring other people in to let them see but yes in a controlled manner i completely agree to that but the question is um how do we um how can we op how can we better open up our um more traumatized community members or, you know, people who are really, it's really painful, whatever reason. Like I said, we're not judging anybody, but it is true. People have been harmed. This racism isn't just a word in the sky that, you know, oh, it was racism. No, people get hurt by racism. And sometimes the hurt is not even repairable, to be honest. They're always scarred in some way, right? So how do we, uh, my question to you is, how do we open their minds to a little more 
promoting inclusivity.